start us off with what brought about Irv Muchnick's uh, work and what brought about this this renewed investigation, and then we got to talk about why did it take this fucking long. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the you know obviously the situation, um, the death of Nancy in Argentina was in 1983, and and um, you know the, um, a couple of years later, I was in Florida and I met um, one of Nancy Argentino's sisters um, at, uh, and I don't even remember exactly where I was, and and it was actually I was talking to her boyfriend who was a professional wrestler at the time. And then in, in the course of the conversation, she mentioned to me, you know, my sister is Nancy Argentino. And I go, wow. You know, it's like, and we'd talk for like, a long, you know, quite a while when she just brought it up. It's kind of like you're, wow, that's interesting. And then she kind of told me, you know, the story of what happened. I mean, I'd heard the stories at the time, but I didn't know the details. And she kind of told me the details. And I believe that I actually at one point told her Mushnick in conversation, you know, I met Nancy Argentino's sister. And there was a, a lawsuit filed by the family, and they wanted default judgment, and they never got paid. So there's something to this. So he went head on. He went to Allentown in um, in the early '90s. You know, talked to everyone he could. Uh, the people at the building uh, slammed the you know the ag hall slammed the door. He was he was the you know the New York outsider coming to Allentown um, yeah. to uh, investigate their their little uh, town secret, right? So, so that happened, and he wrote a story, and there were other stories, and he ended up, as as the years went by, um, becoming very good friends with the two sisters, um, Lorraine and um, um, God, I forgot the other one, Louise, Louise and Lorraine, and um, so he, it was always on the case. And then the the thing I think that really brought it back it was two things. Number one was Snooker published an autobiography in 2012 where he talked about it and, and said that he never did anything and that, you know, she died, but she peed on the, she was, they stopped the car on the way to Allentown. She peed on the road. She slipped, hit her head on the a rock or something. They went to the, to the city. I mean, to the, to the motel, she wasn't feeling well, but you know, everything was fine. Then she, he comes back to the room after wrestling that night and she's dying. He calls 911. He never hit her or anything like that. Um, and then the sisters were furious and, and, and other people, I guess, were, were furious as well. And at that point, um, that happened. And then the next year in 2013, the Allentown paper did a front page story, which was the 30th. The, 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 the morning call, right? The, the Allentown, Allentown morning, morning call. Did, it was a great story. And it was the 30th anniversary of the death of Nancy Argentino, this, you know, unsolved death of, you know, in, in the motel room with this famous celebrity wrestler in their town. Um, and it had a lot of information. It was very difficult to get information this whole 30 years because the police always labeled it as an ongoing investigation, even though after two weeks after the death, they never did anything. So, but because it was an ongoing investigation, they were able to use confidentiality to keep all the records that they had sealed. So nobody well, yeah, really that- could find that's the important point to make, even though, like you said, after a couple of weeks after the incident, they never did anything else. The, the investigation never went anywhere after that, and there was no active effort, but they never closed the case because if they closed the case, people could get a hold of all the records, right? Right. So, but, but somehow, in, in doing so, the local paper got the autopsy report where the, um, the coroner um, said that he, this needs to be investigated as a homicide. And that was somewhat the smoking gun because it kind of like embarrassed the local authorities that here the coroner who investigated it said that. And also there was no, like, if she had fallen by the side of the road um, and hit the back of her head, there would be like little particles of, of gravel and things like that. And there was nothing like that. And the other thing that had never come out was that there were bruises all over her body. I mean, it wasn't like she just, you know, bumped the back of her head. She had bruises on her arms and in and, and different places, which, you know, would in theory be, you know, that there was a fight or something. We're so consistent. The, the, the injuries were consistent with what you would see from either somebody who's been in a fight or a victim of domestic abuse. Right. So when that happened, um, because of that story, uh, the new people, the new um, DA there said, we're going to open up this investigation into this. And, and I thought, and I think most people thought that they're doing that because the newspaper said it, but it's a 30 year old case and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's public posturing. Nothing's going to happen. 
and nothing did happen for you know 18 months. You know, it was supposed to go on after a year. They were supposed to have their results, and they said, well, they didn't give results. They said we're going to go another six months with the investigation. So I figured, well, you know, they think it's a little too soon, and people will get mad. They're going to come up with nothing. So now they're just they're de- delaying the inevitable, right? So then they go six months, and then nothing happens again. And then the, the thing is, is we've got another month after the six before we have to say anything. So we're thinking, like, they're just delaying this thing. So then the day comes out, and then they indict him on, you know, the charges. So – and they released, you know, a lot of their evidence, and it was – you know, so when it's over and, and you read all the evidence, the thing that just hits you like a brick is almost all of this evidence was there 30 years ago. There was – the new the new evidence was an interview that – uh Snooka did on a radio show and, and his book. And, um, there was, uh, a couple of inter- you know, uh, people who came forward during the course of their investigation with new stories. I mean, one of the key ones was the wife of, um, the widow of Buddy Rogers, who was next door neighbors to Snooka, who, you know, didn't even know about the Argentino case, but did know about Snooka and his own wife saying that his wife at the time, um, Carol had come over to her house all bloody and, you know, from allegedly being beaten. And so she was kind of, so in the, in the thing, they also investigated the incident in Syracuse that people won't know. It was a couple of months before where, where Jimmy was dragging Nancy around by the hair and, and the police came and Snooker fought off eight police and two dogs before they finally apprehended him, which was actually yeah, well, Now hold on. Let's, let's not gloss over this uh, because that is another thing that just smacks you in the face. It wasn't that he was dragging her around by the hair. They were the police were called because they were making enough of a disturbance, and there was people screaming and yelling, Snuka and and Nancy Argentino, whoever. That when the cops got there, it was still a hot enough situation, an active situation that Snuka naked was dragging Nancy Argentino naked down the hallway by her hair. In, well, and in, even in the hotel, and, and, and I mean. The, the thing is, I mean, when you talk about enough of the situation, there were cops that came and they saw him. And you remember what Jimmy Snooker looked like in 1983. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, he was he was, a uh, you know, super, you know, 250 pounds, super muscular guy. And they took one look and they said, hey, you know, I mean, they didn't go after him right away. They said, we need backup. So it ended up with eight people and two dogs or not nine men and two dogs, actually showed up. And then they, you know, after a, a struggle that involved, you know, the dogs biting and all this, they, they, they took him in and he, he paid a fine and, and that was that. But that was, that happened months before her death. So it was kind of like in, in the course of what they gave to the grand jury, you had this incident where, um, you know, the, the, there was, there was a, a, a domestic abuse thing with his wife that was alleged a couple of months after her death, and then the incident in Syracuse with her before the death, so it it created a a pattern there. But I mean, the whole the whole thing when you read all of the evidence, I mean, even even if you throw that stuff out that I just said, and you just read the reports from the coroner and what Snuka had told different people that night, you you would go in there and go like, you know, you would have to seriously investigate this case. How as, much how much shit happens? How many? Cases are pressed in court every day on a sliver of amount of evidence as opposed to this that, that didn't go anywhere is, is the exactly. whole point of the thing. Right, and then the thing is is he told like several different stories, and I mean the whole thing is, is the, as I – when I read everything, this is the way I interpreted what happened. Okay, so the, the night he, – he comes back from, from wrestling that night at the TV tapings, and she's in bad shape. They call nine one one. They come in there, and and Jimmy is, is is at this point, I think, telling the truth as much as he knows it, saying that you know, uh, you know, something happened. I pushed her. She fell. She hit her head. So so. But it was a playing that, around type of thing that I've just play, you know, just pushed and ah, uh, you know, well, at, maybe at not first, even, he, maybe not even maybe not even okay. So maybe not even that. But he tells that to the police officers. Now now he gets to the hospital and he tells the nurses a story. And I think he's trying to be honest because it's like she's in rough shape and obviously he doesn't want her to die. Right. So so he's, he's, he's being as honest as he could without burying himself, so to speak. Well, then she dies. OK, the next morning, I mean, he's got a completely different story. That's the peeing on the side of the road story because yeah. it's like she's dead. And, and you know what I mean? I, I, you know, well, and now and, he's and, also had time to think of something. Or, or, or someone thought for him. 
Yeah. You know, you're talking about you're talking about the difference between one AM and, and look, Jimmy was the, the you know, at the time, Jimmy was the biggest star in the company at the time. So, you know, you're you're I don't think he's doing this on his own and Fuji's in the room with him while this is all going on and you know Fuji, right? Fuji went yeah. right to Vince McMahon, without a doubt. So, I mean Vince I mean, I, there's no doubt in my mind Vince McMahon was aware of this. What happened between Vince and, and Snuka between whatever it is, 1 a.m. and 10 a.m. the next morning, I, well, I have no it, idea. It, it also makes sense because Fuji would have been the guy in the hotel room, or not in the hotel, but in the hotel. Fuji would have been the guy that any of the guys would have gone to as 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 a veteran, as, as you know, old Uncle Harry, as what do I do? Give me some advice. Or right. at least to be there. And then obviously... Fuji would have gone straight back to to Vince, if not in person by phone or whatever. So he would have known about it shortly afterwards. Um, and and you know, last week on the program, this is one of the things. Last week, when I started talking about it, I prefaced it for like two minutes with, you know, hey, I was a huge Jimmy Snuka fan when when I first saw him for Mid Atlantic Wrestling, and before I got in the business, when I could you know go to Cincinnati and see him live, and what an amazing athlete, and what. A, the scariest looking, toughest look. You you thought he was he was the baddest guy on the planet. He just had that look, and and I spent a long time saying, you know, I was a fan of his and how great he was and etc. But is is he the is he the Bill Cosby of of wrestling? Is nobody wanted to believe this shit because they were blinded by celebrity and and fandom and whatever. But all of a sudden, this more of the shit comes out. The more it's like, hey, you know, seriously. Um, this case, obviously, if it had happened to anybody else, even if they weren't guilty, they'd have probably got convicted and this never even got pressed. And what about the story of why would, why would you put in your book that if you got away with murder, why would you write a book? And did the WWF have anything or E have anything to do with the book being released? It was, it was not a W it was not a WWF book. Yeah. But Jimmy in the book says that, you know, Vince McMahon came two weeks after there was a big meeting or a big, uh, you know, the police, Jimmy and Vince were all in a room and Jimmy says, you know, Vince came in with a suitcase, whatever that's supposed to mean, you know, whatever. Um, and didn't leave I mean, with it. Right. <laughs> well, that <laughs> I don't know. That well, I don't know. It, but, that's, that's the inferred. But, 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 he came but, in but, with, he came in with a briefcase, right? That he's actually given clues in his own book. Why would you do that? Yeah. 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 I, and, 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 um, yeah, and, and, and it essentially said, like, I don't know, did he, you know, Jimmy in his own book did say, like, I don't know if he paid off the family or not. And, I mean, I guess from what I understand, um, the mother was called, the mother has claimed that she was called and, and was offered $25,000 by the company, which, you know, she said, screw it, because that's when it was like, you know, because they, they had hired a private investigator immediately because they didn't buy the, you know, the story. And the private investigator came back to him and said, you know, he didn't buy the story either, uh, but he didn't think he could win the case against them and take their money. But he did go to maybe, the maybe district attorney. Maybe he took the twenty-five grand. Maybe the private investigator <laughs> took a twenty-five. No, but he went to the district attorney and he was going like, "You, you need to prosecute this," and um, and he just said that he was like completely stonewalled and he couldn't understand why he was stonewalled because everything, all the evidence that he had indicated it should be prosecuted. Then they hired the family hired a second attorney. They did file suit. They won a five hundred thousand dollar judgment, and then Snuka claimed bankruptcy. You know, and he had no money, and and they never they never got any money out of that. How, so how do you how do you remain a a fairly public citizen for most of the last thirty years, and and actually appear on television in one form or another for one promotion or another, and still never have to pay a penny of a legal judgment against you? I don't know, but OJ is the same thing. Well, that's true. You know, I mean, OJ never he's, paid. He's not making much money in the prison laundry these days, but no, no, but but, um, and I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure his economic situation got really bad at certain points, but he was still making a lot of money from his NFL pension all those years. You know, before he got, you know, you know what I mean. But here's the thing. Um, besides the the the, the judgment, etc., just the idea um, that. Once again, he could be a public person for 30 years or whatever, and that nothing more is done. Um, I get the, some of the same people, and this is what gets me some of the same people that came to this original conclusion 
in uh, Allentown 30 years ago are still involved. What's the guy's name? Procanion? But so, Procanion was Canyon. still around. It, what's, 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 what's the key to this investigation that's so interesting is, you know, this is 32 years later. And so you would think that, like, you know, the nurses and things like that, so many of them would have passed away. And, and there are people involved in the case, one of the detectives who actually contacted Irv Marshnik, um, you know, who, was, who had told his son, you know, how frustrated he was that this thing wasn't prosecuted. And the son, you know, I told Irv Mushnick, you know, like that his dad would have been happy when he heard about the indictment a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, you know, he had passed away, but most of them hadn't. And, and most of them were still in, in like one of them is now, you know, a, a respected judge who's the guy who actually made the call not to prosecute. Um, Pro Canyon still, would, you know, I mean, he's actually a, a higher ranked um, detective and he was actually the guy in charge of this investigation, which is so interesting because at first, you know, he was the one defending the original thing. And he was, and when, when he was put in charge of this investigation, I remember Irv Mushnick telling me, you know, because Irv Mushnick said that the guy lied, Pro Canyon lied to his face and just said that, you know, there's only, Jimmy Snook only told one story and that was it. But Pro Canyon told other reporters different stories, um, including the Allentown paper guys. I mean, he had told them how he thought it went down in 2013, you know, like the nature of how the shove was and things like that. But anyway, when, when he was named the head of the investigation, it was another thing where we were going like, this is some public thing that they're just going to, you know, uh, basically say like, you know, we were, we, you know, the Warren Commission, right? You know, we were, yeah. we were right all along. Um, but it didn't turn out that way. I mean, I was, I was stunned that morning when, when those indictments came because it was like, you know, from, for, you know, 19 months, it's just, you know, okay, I know how this ends. You know what I mean? But, and, but and at it, the same it, time now, it does, is that, that's some that's kabuki ish to me that some of the same, especially one of the main guys that said, Oh no, don't do anything about this thirty years ago. He's still involved in the case. Does he want to see a conviction, even if it's uh, just a just one, because that would prove that he was an idiot thirty years ago? Or or is he trying to right some kind of wrong that he, you know, has changed his mind? I'd be a little nervous well, well, about having the same people involved that has taken thirty years to get to this point. Well, the guy who made the the guy who made the call not to prosecute, you know, who's now a judge. I mean, he's completely out of it. But uh, the detective, um, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, thirty years you go through, you could, you know, you, you may go through a lot of phases. And again, it's like, you know, maybe at, at some point, you know, who 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 knows what's going through their head? It's it's it's, you know, again, it, it wasn't even Allentown. It was actually Whitehall. So it's a small town. And, you know, Vince McMahon and WWE, they come into Allentown every three weeks. They put on shows. Uh, Jimmy Snook is, a, you know, he was a weird kind of celebrity, as you understand, you'll understand this. I mean, he was a huge celebrity, but at the time, um, he wasn't, you know, it's like wrestlers weren't celebrities, but they were in 1983, if you, you, you know what I mean. They, 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 were, they were celebrities to the large amounts of people that watched the TV shows and, and went to the matches, but they got very little mainstream publicity uh, for the general populace that wasn't into wrestling. Right. So, so they, were, they, were, you know, they, were, they were bigger stars to the wrestling fans 30 years ago, but they were smaller stars to the average, average public. Maybe that's how they used to get away with all this shit. You know, in, in a way, I mean, I I consider they were they were bigger stars because every you know they were they were they were actually bigger stars, but they got reported on less. Is how I always would consider it. So you know, because it's like this this stuff. If this stuff had happened today, it would have been a national news story. You know, a famous you know again like Snooker. Snooker could be the equivalent of Faliasina, you know, or or you know uh, maybe right underneath. Um, and if something like that happened, I mean, it'd be, be it'd be gigantic. But then you know when Nancy Argentino died. I remember the New York paper. It was it was like a graph one day in the paper that a woman died in the hotel room with with Jimmy Snuka, and that was it. And no, nothing was ever said again. What, what's what is Snuka's condition these days? Because we know he, he's had the stomach cancer, and you know he's been known throughout the years for for playing. I think even one of the detectives said he was at the time he was playing the dumb island boy, and Vince was doing the talking. Right. It, it, you know, I I know he he was just he was at WrestleCade last November and pacing around and uh, said hello and passed a few words and seemed to be fine. Has has his condition gone rapidly downhill or is is he potentially milking that like that old mob boss that used to walk around the streets in in Brooklyn in in uh, his pajamas to avoid prosecution? Yeah, I mean, I just know that when 
you know, the story came out, his, his lawyer in Allentown said that, you know, he's suffering from dementia. And then I had people go, like, hey, I talked to him, you know, a month ago. I talked to him three months ago. And, you know, you can have a conversation with him, and that's just not right. I mean, so, I mean, he, you know, he, Jimmy, you know, w- would not take the stand in, it went, during the investigation. He never spoke, um, you know, so, and, and probably just because he had so many contradicting stories from different people, it would have, it would have probably been a disaster had he done it. So it was probably in his best interest not to, but, um, Pro- promos yeah, were so, never, so, never his strong point anyway, to begin yeah, with. But, <laughs> so. Yeah. But I mean, as far as the dementia aspect goes, I think that's greatly overplayed and, and, um, but you know, yeah, he's, he's suffering from stomach cancer. Um, that's one of the reasons why they didn't keep him in prison and they, they, they set bail to, for him to, to get out because it was like, it was, it was, you know, he needed medical care and what would end up happening is, is the state would have to pay for all his medical care if he was in prison the whole yeah. time. So, and they didn't think that, you know, they didn't think he was at risk to be running or anything like that. Um, so they, you know, they, they, they set bail at a hundred thousand. Well, I tell you, I, you know, once again, was a big fan, et cetera, and it's another one of the boys, and you hate to see the boys get sideways. And if this was you, – you, it, it's I don't even know if it's a benefit of the doubt thing because if this was the only incident that had ever been reported, well, everybody can fuck up, and were they drunk or whatever, and blah, blah, blah. But when – obviously there was a pattern not only with the same girl but also with his wife, and, and, and Buddy Rogers and, even and- made the comment at, at one time, I think, well, he's the sweetest guy in the world, but when he's on the shit – which everybody was in those days in wrestling practically at the top, you know, he turns into an, a Jimmy Snuka turning into an animal in those days would not be something you'd want to fucking see. No. Um, so, no. And you buddy, know, with all you know, of that is, different, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Buddy, I mean, Buddy knew him pretty well. Cause you remember Buddy was with him, not just in New York, which people know, but also in the Carolinas. Right. That's, and, I think that's how they got put together in New York was because they did it in the Carolinas. Right. Yeah. And then the other thing too is, Okay, so when Nancy Argentino passed away, uh, Jimmy's family was still living in the Carolinas. Okay, and and uh, you know he was working in in New York in the Northeast Territory in WWF, WWF. Now after that, they moved. Now they moved to Haddonfield, New Jersey. You know I don't know if it was next door or you know two houses down from Buddy. So it's like if you're, um, I mean that tells you how close you are. If like like you're, let's just say. You're, you're in, in the old days, like, you know, you're going from territory to territory and you're not, your, your family's in a different territory. And it's kind of like, whatever reason, you know, the, you, you move your family up because you're doing great in the territory and you're going to stay or whatever the reason is. Maybe, maybe the wife got mad that this came out and wants to make sure she's there. Right. You move, you, you know, we're going to move next door to, who, you know, to another wrestler. It's probably going to be someone you're really tight with. It's not going to be someone, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and they, so so they were tight, but at the end, obviously, over and it was over. You know the the um, the situation with the white buddy and Jimmy were not tight at the end. You know, and that was the reason why. Well, I just you know, like I said, um, everybody wants to give the celebrity the benefit of the doubt, and is he the Bill Cosby of wrestling? With all of this stuff going on, the the. The worst you can say is obviously he didn't mean to do it, or the best you can say is obviously he didn't mean to do it if he did it, blah, 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 allegations, whatever. But that many incidents in really a short period of time, you got to think he may have been fucking out of control on the shit. And if so, well, that's terrible, but it's his fucking fault ultimately. So, you know, if I was Nancy Argentino's family, I would be at this point more angry at the people who prevented this for 30 years or, or, or who didn't press it or didn't get anything done about it for 30 years than I would be against the guy that actually did it, I think. Yeah, well, all, all I know is, is that that's still like the big unanswered question because when you, when you look at the evidence and the statements and things like that, it, it all pointed right to him. I mean, there's people who go, well, they didn't have enough for a conviction, but the fact that they just stopped after two weeks investigating yeah. – you know, it's like, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of, I don't know. I mean, I mean the, the coroner himself said, you know, I had suspicion, but I didn't have enough for a conviction because the, the key that he said was, I can prove, you know, that, that there were marks on her body and that he probably did the marks, but were those the blows that killed him, you know, killed her? 
I can't prove that, but it was a death from a blow to the back of the head. So at worst, if he didn't hit her in the back of the head, and he probably didn't, it probably was hitting something on the way down, but whether it was a shove or, or what it was, it still was something that, that, you know, he's in the room with her and she hits her head on something, a desk or something. Um, and you know, she's got marks on her body, you know, how, that would, how, go, to, that would go to court anywhere in the world. That's what I'm thinking. And, like, and, and how do you just like after two weeks say, you know, well, we're dropping this case. 